Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about gases in the ocean, and we're going to be really talking about uh, two uh, climatic and biologically important gases, that is oxygen, which is important for life, and carbon dioxide, which is important for the... And we're not uh, just going to be talking about the gases, but we're going to be talking about the whole, particularly for the carbon dioxide uh, gas, we're going to be talking about the whole carbon system in the ocean. And that includes uh, the carbonates. So uh, this is the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we're going to see how the, the formation of calcium carbonates in the ocean impacts uh, atmospheric CO2. And that turns out to be quite important. Um, and of course, how uh, gases uh, determine where life can happen in the ocean and things like that. So that's the plankton up there. So to start off with, um, these are the main gases in the ocean. The most abundant gas in the ocean is nitrogen because it is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere. Okay? And if you've watched the introductory video, which a few of you have, um, you, you'll know that the concentration of a gas dissolved in the, the water is proportional to the concentration of the gas in the atmosphere overlying. Okay? Uh, and I did a little demonstration in the practical to show this, and I'll do that again in the practical on Tuesday for those that, uh, that didn't come to the, the one yesterday. Okay? So the other gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, the ones we're going to be talking about uh, today. But there are lots of other gases. Anything that's dissolved, well, any, any gas that's in the atmosphere will dissolve in the ocean. Okay? And that's this concept of Henry's Law. Do, if you haven't already, watch the video about that. If you don't understand anything, at least after uh, the practical on Tuesday, um, then come and um, you know, find me, ask questions about it, all that kind of stuff. Um, quite a lot of the gases, nitrogen, um, no gases are inert, they don't really have anything to do with life at all. Um, so although nitrogen or nitrate is critical for life, the, the most abundant form, which is nitrogen, is, is not really bioavailable. So you need to do some very energetic process, like lightning or uh, nitrogen fixation, to, um, to turn that into something useful. We're not going to be talking about it today. Okay? Um, and because the other gases are not really used by life, you can think of them as behaving conservatively in the ocean. Okay? So they should have fairly uniform concentrations. The ratios of them are fairly uniform. Now, um, oxygen and carbon dioxide are definitely not conservative elements because they're constantly being used up by life. So their fluxes into and out of the ocean are quite high relative to their stocks. Okay? And that's quite important. Okay, so that's, um, uh, this is kind of a way of summarizing these, da these data in a table. But uh, the thing I want to point out in here, so this is a table that's got uh, kind of the percentage, the composition of the gases in air. You can see nitrogen's got the most up there. I think in, uh, in the introductory video I said that oxygen was 22%, it's 21. How much of an idiot am I? Um, and then carbon dioxide, uh, this should be 0 0.04 now. So this is quite an old... Uh, uh, table, but um, so the carbon dioxide concentration is 400 parts per million. Uh, uh, but what you can see is when the stuff gets dissolved in the ocean, we don't have that same ratio. Okay, so it looks like we're, we've got much, much more um, carbon dioxide or carbon dissolved in seawater than we have nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, so one of the questions we're going to look at is why is that? Okay, and the introductory video. Um, went through that in some way that some of the gases have different solubility constants, but also crucially for carbon dioxide, the CO2 partitions into different carbon species when it dissolves. So it's not just dissolving, it reacts with the water to form carbonate and bicarbonate ions, which means you can store much, much more carbon in the ocean than you can the other gases. Okay? So if you, if you didn't get that, watch the videos. Um, they hopefully will be informative. Okay, so this is just to show uh, that solubility relationship. So in the, in the introductory video, we talked about uh, the concept of a solubility constant. So that's kind of like the ratio of if you've got a certain partial pressure or concentration in the atmosphere, that determines the concentration in the ocean. But uh, that solubility constant is not constant. It's dependent on temperature. So at colder temperatures, you can store more gas in the ocean. Uh, and it's also slightly dependent on salinity. 
Okay, and this, this, this graph here is a little bit uh, misleading uh, because this is kind of showing that the salinity is making quite a big difference in solubility compared to temperature. Okay, so temperatures may be going from uh, seawater from what's maybe uh, nine to, to seven millilitres per litre of oxygen. Now, uh, whereas the salinity looks like it has a similar magnitude of maybe two uh, millilitres per litre control. But of course, the variation of salinity in the ocean is not the whole variation from fresh water to um, seawater. So the seawater salinity variations might take you only up and down by a very small amount in here. It's a small detail. Okay, so we're thinking about now some of what are the processes that are happening in the ocean. Okay, so first, the, the most important process when we're talking about gases is really exchange with the atmosphere. Okay, so if you leave a system for long enough, you'll reach this equilibrium where the, the concentration of the dissolved gas in the ocean and the atmosphere is related to this solubility um, constant. Now, that process of equilibration can be speeded up if you have lots of waves and lots of bubbles in the ocean, okay, mixing the atmosphere and the ocean together, okay. Um, uh, we have a small component for some gases of volcanic emissions, uh, but these on the kind of a global scale are actually quite small for, for CO2, certainly for oxygen. Um, but what we're going to be talking about for most of this lecture are some of the processes that happen within the ocean that, uh, that affect the distribution of gases between the top layer of the ocean. Okay, so this is the, the maybe the, the warm, buoyant surface layer of the ocean. Then we have this thing called pycnocline, which is basically a density stratification. So sometimes this is referred to as a thermocline because the density stratification is mostly dependent on um, temperature rather than salinity. Um, there's, I mean, it's sometimes also referred to the halocline if there's a, a salt-driven uh, density <coughs> stratification. But that's, you know, um, not really relevant for this talk. But basically you have a buoyant surface layer of the ocean that can exchange with the atmosphere. And then there are processes, which we'll talk about today, which can exchange some of the gases between the surface and the deep layers of the ocean. Okay, so, we, I mean, this is a, a very long, tedious table of those processes. So, um, okay, the most important ones are this difference in gas concentration. So this is if you've got a, a large concentration in the atmosphere, that will force the ocean to have a large concentration. So that's kind of Henry's law. Um, that can be speeded up. Uh, by wave mixing and bubbles in the ocean, so kind of that's this guy up here. So the, the temperature and salinity feed into this Henry's law gas solubility constant, which hopefully you realize now is absolutely not constant. Um, and then you've got these other guys down here, photosynthesis, respiration, decomposition. Okay, how do they affect these gases? Okay. Um, so first of all, we're going to be looking at oxygen. So this is a, a cartoon of uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so we've got the Northern Hemisphere up here. It's kind of like Iceland and, and uh, Greenland up here, and the Southern Ocean down here. Now, uh, in the high latitudes, okay, where it's, uh, where it's cold, okay, that increases the solubility of oxygen in the water. Okay, so there will be more oxygen in uh, the surface water here than there will be in the surface water at the equator. Because uh, it's because it's colder, more can dissolve in the water. Okay, and then there are these processes that happen that that mean that we, we basically can take that water and vect it down into the deep ocean. This is deep ocean kind of water mass formation, which you'd have done with Simon. That brings oxygen-rich water into the deep ocean. But then in between the deep and the surface ocean, you have stuff that goes on. Okay, so we'll have a look at those processes. So these are um, some actual uh, profiles uh, that I made on a cruise uh, a couple of years ago off um, Portugal there. And we've got the concentration of oxygen in millilitres per litre on the uh, left and uh, fluorescence. So this is a measure of uh, photosynthetic biological activity okay, on the right. And the thing to just point out is that the vertical scale is different at the top. So it goes from naught to, I think, 100 meters. And then this, there's basically a second <coughs> graph plotted underneath it, again, from naught to 5,000 meters. So I've just expanded this top part of the water column. Okay, So you can see in the surface ocean, you've got a maximum of uh, photosynthetic, well, a maximum of biology going on at the base of the thermocline. 
Okay, so you actually don't have the maximum at the surface where there's the most light because uh, the very surface of the ocean uh, is being um, stripped out of all its nutrients. Okay? In this case, we're supplying nutrients from the upwelling of deep water. Okay, so we're basically supplying nutrients at the thermocline okay, between the deep ocean and the surface, and that's causing there to be lots of biological activity going on. Here, and if we look, that corresponds to, if we compare to the surface here, an increase in the concentration of um, oxygen. Okay. So, first of all, we've got a process going on at the very surface where we're equilibrating the atmosphere and the ocean. Okay, so that's process A. You could write that down, A here, um, on your little slide thing I've given you. So that's equilibration of the gas between the ocean and the atmosphere. And then at B, okay, hopefully you'll, 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 you'll have twigged on that where we have lots of photosynthesis, blah, 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 photosynthesis going on, we're producing oxygen <coughs> in the water. Okay? So we're taking oxygen and dissolved carbon dioxide and we're producing uh, organic matter and oxygen. Okay, so that's what's happening here. Okay. Um, so actually, if this, if this water at the base of the thermocline was mixed up to the <coughs> surface, that means that there would be more oxygen in the water than there should be compared to the atmospheric concentration. So it would actually be a flux of oxygen from the ocean into the atmosphere. Okay. And actually, that is where 50% of the uh, oxygen in the atmosphere comes from. It comes from the surface layer of the ocean. So if we look down into the water column, okay, if we go down to about 1,000 metres here, we can see that we're starting to get a much lower concentration of oxygen. Okay, just point out that this isn't down to zero in this case. We've got 4 to 5 on our scale here. So in other parts of the ocean, this might go down a little bit more, but... But in this part of the ocean here, we've got a re reduction in the concentration, and that's because of respiration. So the organic matter that's, that's being formed up here is sinking down into the ocean, and as it sinks down, it stops photosynthesizing because there's no light, and it starts dying and being respired by bacteria. And that process uses up oxygen in the water. Okay? So that's respiration. Write that down in C at the bottom there. And then D, if... If imagine that's what, if we just had a, a, a just a very simple water column that wasn't moving around the ocean, okay, then the organic matter that's being used up here, okay, would use up the oxygen, and any organic matter that's left would sink down into the ocean some more and use up more oxygen. Okay, so we might see just a, a, a carrying on in decrease in concentration as we go down. Now that's not the case, okay, because the ocean is not a static column of water. It's being moved around a lot. So this is water that's formed at the surface somewhere else, okay, possibly at the high latitudes, and has been advected from the surface down and come along. Okay? So that's why we have this increase at the bottom. So this is advection, advection of oxygen-rich water. Okay? Okay, so if we look at uh, a map of this process, so we were, we were looking uh, at uh, just off Portugal here. Um, which was a very nice cruise to be on. Uh, and you can see here that we've got this uh, very strong latitudinal control, north-south control, on the concentration of oxygen in the surface water. And this is, almost all of this pattern is due to the surface water temperature. Okay? So at high latitudes where the water is very cold, um, you have lots of oxygen dissolved in it. And then at low latitudes, you have less oxygen dissolved in it. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at slices going down through the ocean at different levels. So that, this map at the top uh, left uh, is the same map that I've just showed you. Now as we go down to 100 metres, 300 metres, 1,000 metres, you can see we get these regions which start to show up as, uh, as purple colours, okay? And these are very, very low in oxygen. So we're in that zone C on the, on the profiles where we're uh, adding organic matter from the surface ocean and it's respiring and it's using up oxygen. Okay? And anywhere that's below this, this kind of magic number, it's not magic, it's just an arbitrary value of 0.45 millilitres per litre or 20 micromole per litre oxygen, this is a level of oxygen that is low enough 
the macrofauna, okay, so big fish and, or little fish, um, any kind of like multicellular big thing, can't really survive. Okay, it's too low. So this is the, the kind of environment where really specialist organisms like the, uh, the vampire squid can survive. Okay? Um, so if you look at what the reason for that is, if you looked at where those places were, they tended to be on the, 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 the western side of, of continents and along the equator. And these are places where you have strong upwelling of nutrient-rich deep water to the surface where lots and lots of biological productivity can happen. So these are hugely biologically productive areas. Okay? Lots of plankton doing its thing. But that means that there's lots of organic matter sinking to the bottom or sinking through the water column okay, and using up the oxygen as it, as it basically decays. So this is, uh, this is kind of a slice cartoon to the ocean of that kind of process happening. So we have uh, basically water that's not only got low oxygen, but because it's had all of these um, organic matter rain down into it, it's also quite high in nutrients. Okay, and that, when that gets up to the surface, we can have a, a bloom of a phytoplankton that can kind of like kick off lots and lots of, of life. But... Um, and that causes organic matter to rain back down and further deplete the oxygen in the deep water. Now, that would be fine, okay, because, you know, we don't live in the deep water, and actually most of the fish don't live in this deep water. Most of the fish are kind of up here. And the problem is that if you have uh, this process going on uh, a lot, okay, that means you might have ex very, very um, severe plankton blooms, which can cause kind of toxic... Um, uh, algal blooms because of their sheer abundance. So they do release some toxins, which is bad for fish and people that swim in the water. Um, but kind of worse than that is that if this zone gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it depletes in oxygen and basically gets thicker and thicker layer of water with no oxygen in, in kind of extreme storm events or strong winds, you can upwell this water that's got no oxygen into it up into the shallows on the shelf. Okay? And if that happens, bad times. Uh, so it kills all the fish, okay? which then makes you this huge lump of biomass which is then decaying and dying and, and causing even further deoxygenation of the water. Okay? So this, I mean, this is catastrophic for fisheries and kind of like um, things like that. And also, it's quite bad for the fish as well, which is um, kind of obvious, really. Okay, so the reason for that, this equation here, is that uh, we're basically doing decomposition of this. Okay, so when we use up our 106 carbons, every time that carbon is, is respired, we're using up 138 oxygens. Okay, so that's that's um, that's the process. That's Okay, um, now uh, this should be familiar to those of you that did the practical, but uh, if we look into the deep ocean, uh, we can see how this kind of process happens. So this is now, so looking deeper than that kind of oxygen minimum zones, which were kind of maybe down to 1,000 meters. So this is uh, a slice of the ocean at, at uh, 3,500 meters. And you can see when deep water first forms, Okay, in regions of deep water, we get a lot of deep water formation in the North Atlantic up here and in the Weddell Sea. It's got quite high oxygen concentration because it was at the surface recently and it was very cold. Okay, so it doesn't warm up when it gets to the deep ocean, uh, but it has um, life constantly raining down organic matter into it. So as the water mass gets older, as it's been isolated from the surface for longer, and it, as it progressively moves around the ocean, okay, we gradually deplete the deep water oxygen. Okay, so that's kind of, as it moves around this conveyor, it gets, uh, it gets older. Um, and you have the, the counter to that, that as it's the oxygen is being used up, you're releasing those nutrients again. So this is uh, a section again through the Atlantic, so this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. And as that water flows along, we're adding the nutrients in, and the oxygen here, you can see, is being depleted along that flow path. Okay, so the distribution, therefore, of oxygen in the deep ocean is a, is a combination of 
the advection, okay? Uh, so the, 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 the rate at which deep waters and even intermediate waters are replaced. So that, that layer of the ocean between kind of 300 and 1,000 meters, if you start circulating the ocean really, really quickly, you start to replace that oxygen poor water, I say oxygen depleted, not in sediment pores, uh, that, that oxygen poor water, you, you, you start replacing that with fresher, not I say more <coughs> oxygenated, still salty water from somewhere else. Okay? So the, the balance of whether a part of the ocean is, is oxygen poor, and therefore unhealthy, you could say, is a balance between the amount of biological productivity and the physical ocean circulation. Okay? So it's, kind of a, it's a nice interplay of physics and biology that basically are determining how, how, how habitable the, the ocean is. Okay? Uh, just here you can see that, that those two kind of like oxygen and nutrients are kind of very tightly anti-correlated in the ocean. And you'll see that in the practical, or you have seen that in the practical already. Okay, so we're going to talk now about carbon in the ocean. Uh, so uh, this is a figure from the IPCC, uh, quite an old one now. Um, but you can see on this that uh, you have some carbon in the atmosphere, okay, but we have much, much more. So we have, I guess this may be up towards six, uh, uh, almost 700 now um, gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. Ocean has got, in the, even just in the surface layer of the ocean, uh, there's more carbon dissolved in the whole of the atmosphere. And then in the deep ocean, there's orders of magnitude more. It's like 37,000, 40,000 um, gigatons of carbon dissolved in the ocean. Okay? And the reason for that, which we went over in the int introductory video, is that when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, okay, so that's this guy at the top here, carbon dioxide goes from a gaseous phase into an aqueous phase. So that is determined, the, the relative concentrations of these two chemical species in the atmosphere and the ocean, that's determined by Henry's law. But as soon as you dissolve and form this aqueous CO2, it reacts with water. Okay, so these are not part of the Henry's Law kind of relationship. So these are basically hidden away extra carbon that we can store in the ocean. Okay? And critically, the, the relative proportions of the key species, so uh, this guy here, carbonic acid, doesn't really hang around much in the ocean. That's, um, that's very unstable. So you can kind of add together the concentration of, of carbonic acid and the concentration of aqueous CO2, and that's almost identical to the concentration of CO2, so we kind of ignore it. But the, the, if we just take the, the total, so this is total dissolved inorganic carbon, so this is the sum of all of the carbon species, so it's a little bit counterintuitive that this symbol for this is sigma CO2, because it's not just CO2, it's the concentration of CO2 aqueous plus bicarbonate iron and carbonate iron. And it turns out that most of the, the carbon in the ocean is in this form, and the relative proportions of these is dependent on the pH of the ocean, so how acid it is. But critically, only the CO2 aqueous exchanges with the atmosphere. Okay, and that's kind of like uh, just a reminder of what pH is. So pH is kind of the, the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. It's not, that's not actually the true definition of pH, but that will do for now. Okay. Um, and the ocean is uh, slightly basic, so it's got a, a pH of about 8.1, 8.2. Okay. Um, so because <coughs> only this CO2 can exchange with the atmosphere, if we can change the relative proportions of CO2 aqueous to bicarbonate to carbonate, that means that we can change what the atmospheric CO2 concentration is. So because there's so much more carbon in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere, if the ocean really determines what the atmospheric concentration is. So if we, if we start to acidify the ocean and make that there's more proportionally more CO2 than there is this guy, that means that there'll be much more CO2, CO2 aqueous that can exchange with the atmosphere. So the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will go up. Okay? And that's kind of summarized on this diagram here, which is basically showing the relative proportions of the different carbon species at different pHs. Okay? And critically, only the CO2, the CO2 star here just means it's CO2 plus bicarbonate, but it could just be CO2. 
Um, so at high pHs, so alkaline conditions, we have mostly uh, carbonate ion, and that means there's not much CO2 to exchange with the atmosphere, so that means we can store loads of CO carbon in the ocean, because only a tiny amount of it can exchange with the atmosphere. Whereas if we suddenly then acidify the ocean, then all of that carbon that was locked away can exchange with the atmosphere. And we're at super bad times. Okay, so just that, those dissolved forms of carbon, because you can switch between one form and the other, that to a certain extent can buffer these ch proposed changes in pH. So if you did something to the ocean, if you added some acids to the ocean, okay, what would happen is that, uh, so I've just written out the, those, those, those equilibrium equations as kind of a continuous chain of equations at the top here. So if we added acids to the ocean, what would happen is that it would basically start to drive the equilibria towards the uh, left-hand side, because we're adding in stuff that's on the right-hand side. Okay? So that means that if we try to acidify the ocean just by adding hydrogen ions, uh, we'd change the relative proportions of, of the CO2 species, and that would counteract the change in pH. Okay? So just with the dissolved species, there is a buffering of of pH change. <coughs> but the ocean is not just dissolved forms of carbon, there are also inorganic solid forms of carbon, so these are uh, calcium carbonates uh, and calcium phosphate at the top, we'll kind of ignore the calcium phosphate at the top, but just think about calcium carbonate and what that does. So I've added these kind of reactions in the bottom, and I don't think you have these reactions in your handouts, but you should know them, so write them down. Um, so basically, these reactions at the bottom, so this is precipitation. So this is us forming shells out of calcium carbonate. So we start out with some dissolved calcium and some dissolved carbonate in the ocean, and we form a, we grow a coral, or we, we form a, a bivalve shell. And that takes calcium ions and carbonate ions and forms calcium carbonate. Okay. Uh, the, the counter to that is if we maybe reduce the rate of calcification in the ocean, or we start to dissolve away uh, organisms that have calcium carbonate shells. So if we start to dissolve away the Great Barrier Reef, we take our calcium carbonate that our corals are made of, and we dissolve them. And that returns calcium and, uh, in this case, bicarbonate ions to the ocean. But it doesn't really matter what form of, uh, whether it's carbonate ion or, or bicarbonate, we're adding to the ocean stuff that's on the right-hand side of these equations at the top, okay? or taking out. So if we have a think about what that means in terms of the CO2 system, and this is kind of really, really counterintuitive. So if we start to, let's say we start to grow a coral reef, okay? and that coral reef is made of calcium carbonate. So we're taking stuff that's got carbon in it out of the ocean, okay? but we're also removing carbonate ion from the ocean. Okay? And if we have a look at what that does to this equation at the top here, okay, if we take this out, that's going to start to force the reactions towards the right-hand side. Okay? And the effect of that will be to add hydrogen ions to the ocean. Okay? So actually, taking calcium carbonate out of the ocean by growing coral reefs, for instance, that actually acidifies the ocean. So in the video, it talks about adding CO2 to the atmosphere, that acidifies the ocean. But you can also acidify the ocean by growing coral reefs, okay? which is odd. Um, so if we wanted to counteract ocean acidification, we could dissolve coral reefs, and that would we're adding this guy, which would force these reactions towards CO2, okay, which would uh, remove the hydrogen ions, which would raise the pH, and that would actually mean that we're, we're moving these equilibria more over to the um, right-hand side, and we're therefore lowering atmospheric CO2, lowering ocean acidification. It's quite counterintuitive. Um, but that's, it's all kind of explained on this diagram here, in that if you just think about what happens to the ocean pH when you add or remove calcium carbonate to the ocean, 
Okay, so if you think about calcium carbonate, if you have some HCl, some acid, and some calcium carbonate, the, the calcium carbonate is like a, it's, a, it's an alkali, so it neutralizes the acid. So if you take it out of the ocean, you're reducing the amount of, uh, if you take it out of the ocean by forming a shell out of it, which sinks to the bottom of the sea. If, you, if you're removing that, that acid neutralization capacity, that means you're making the ocean more acid. Okay, which means you do it this way, um, which means that you, you're basically having more carbonate, more bicarbonate, and less CO2 as part of your total dissolved inorganic carbon, which means that you would then um, uh, I've got that the wrong way around. You see, that's why how complicated it is, right? So you've got if you if you start to um, precipitate calcium carbonate you are removing from the ocean the, um, the neutralization capacity of the ocean, so you're making it less alkaline, you're making it more acidic this way towards uh, having more CO2. So if you remove calcium carbonate from the ocean, it makes it more acidic, it makes it, uh, the, the, the relative proportions of CO2, uh, bicarbonate and carbonate, you get more CO2. Now you've removed carbon from the ocean to so the overall amount of dissolved inorganic carbon. So if you add it up, the CO2, the bicarbonate carbon, that would still be less. But the effect of being there being less is, is matters less than changing the relative proportions of CO2, bicarbonate, carbonate. Okay. So uh, to just think about that a little bit more in terms of what is this neutralizing capacity of the ocean. So there's this term called alkalinity, which is up here. So the alkalinity is basically a chemical term for the, the capacity of stuff dissolved in water to, to, um, to neutralize the addition of acid. Okay? And this arises because of a charge imbalance. So if you've got basically three pie charts here. So this is the, the, the composition of conservative elements in the ocean. I say cap, so the, the things that don't really change in concentration. Okay? Now, uh, that's in terms of mass. If you work out how many moles of these things, uh, you get a pie chart that looks a little bit like that. But if you then normalize that to the charge on each of those ions, you get a pie chart that looks like this. We've got the negative ones on this side and the positive ions on this side. Okay? And it looks like they kind of balance out, which is what you expect. Because when you put your hand in the ocean, you don't get an electric shock. Okay? The ocean is electrically neutral. But if we look at this in a little bit more detail, so now I've just put these in two kind of bar charts. So these are all the negatively charged anions on the left, the positively charged cations on the right. And we have a close look at just this top layer. If you do, I think I, I got the, uh, the concentrations of these off Wikipedia, so it must be right. Um, if you add up the concentrations of all these things, you find that there is an imbalance. There is not enough negative charge in the ocean to counteract the positive charge of just the conservative ions. Okay? So that means there must be something else, this alkalinity, we call, that basically makes up the rest of this negative charge. <coughs> so one way of uh, thinking about this is that we basically can define this difference in charge in the ocean as if we add up all of the charges of the conservative elements uh, that are positively charged and take away the concentrations of the ions that are negatively charged, that gives us this total charge imbalance. So another way of working that out is basically what is actually making up that difference in charge. So then we look at some of the non-conservative charged species in the ocean. And those are these. So these are these things we've been talking about already. So bicarbonate, bicarbonate, carbonate ions. See, so this one counts twice because it's got a charge of minus two. Um, you have the uh, borate iron here. Uh, so you have some OH ions, OH ions, some hydrogen ions, all these other, some of the nutrients are charged, okay? So if we add all up the positive, ah, sorry, if we add up all the negative ones and take away all the positive ones, that gives us that charge imbalance there, okay? Now the key thing is that, um, so quite a lot of these have uh, an exchange reaction between two different or maybe even three different species that are dissolved in the ocean that allow them to change their total amount of charge. Okay? So if you look at the, 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 the borate iron here 
uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can change the amount, the relative proportions of borate to boric acid. So this is boric acid here. This is borate. And that can balance any addition or subtraction of um, hydrogen ions. Okay, and critically for the carbon species, so these make up most of total alkalinity. Okay, so these are the most important ones. So that if we have, uh, if we start to add uh, hydrogen ions to the ocean, if we add negative charge, then we uh, add positive charge, then we can, we, can, we can basically counteract that by using up some of our alkalinity and forming one of these. Okay, so let's just all right, take a step back and think about what's the actual effect of this detailed chemistry. Okay? So uh, if we think about what happens if we add CO2 to the ocean. Okay? So this could either be by adding it from the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels or in situ in the ocean by respiring organic matter. So they were adding carbon dioxide. So that means that the total inorganic carbon, okay, the total concentration of dissolved carbon here must go up. Okay, uh, but when we add carbon dioxide, and I'll use the point of those that hopefully will be watching in the video, uh, we, if we add carbon dioxide, we are then adding hydrogen ions, because when carbon dioxide reacts with water, it forms hydrogen ions. So that means that the pH, okay, will go down, okay, becoming more acidic. Now, in this case, it won't have any impact on alkalinity, because we're adding to the ocean... Uh, ultimately bicarbonate ions and carbonate ions, but we're also adding an equal amount of hydrogen ions. Okay, so adding CO2 to the ocean acidifies the ocean, but doesn't affect its capacity to neutralize that acid. Okay? Now if we think about dissolution of calcium carbonate, okay, so we get some coral reef, uh, we start dissolving it, um, so we're adding, in this case, maybe carbonate ions, okay? So we're going to increase the amount of carbon in the ocean dissolved because we're adding one of the components of DIC, dissolved in organic carbon. <coughs> okay? But when we do that, we are also adding um, alkalinity to the ocean, okay? Because we're adding one of the components of this guy, okay? And we're actually removing a hydrogen ion if that carbonate reacts with a hydrogen ion to form bicarbonate. Okay? So this means that the pH will go up and alkalinity will go up. So if we dissolve CO2, sorry, if we, do, sorry, if we dissolve calcium carbonate, we are increasing the total amount of dissolved, dissolved organic carbon. But we're also moving that speciation, uh, we're moving the relative proportions of towards having more bicarbonates. We're moving over to this side of the thing because we're making the pH higher, okay? So this means that, that by dissolving the calcium carbonate, there's actually going to be less of this CO2 present because we're moving more to the right-hand side of this diagram, which means that if you dissolve calcium carbonate, there will be less CO2 to exchange with the atmosphere, okay? So dissolving coral reefs will reduce atmospheric CO2. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of those changes. Uh, so on the right hand, on the left hand side, this is production of organic matter, okay, which is kind of the opposite of um, <coughs> the respiration, which we've just mentioned. So if we produce organic matter, then we're removing dissolved inorganic carbonate, but the pH will go up, alkalinity won't change, and we're reducing the atmospheric CO2 because we're drawing down organic carbon. But if we form calcium carbonate shells, which is the opposite of dissolving the Great Barrier Reef, we remove dissolved inorganic carbon, but we acidify the water, okay? Which means that the atmospheric CO2 will ultimately go up. And this is a problem. Uh, oh, I guess I said this is the Great Barrier Reef, so this is kind of one of the areas I do some research. This is cruise I went on, we mapped it and dredged it, which was kind of bad. Um, but, so dissolving this would be great for the atmosphere. Not so good for tourism. Uh, or biodiversity. Okay, so um, if we look at what are the, the impacts of what we've just discussed about the different effects of producing organic matter or producing calcium carbonate on the carbon cycle. So uh, this is kind of, we add nutrients or to the surface ocean, there's some sunlight, and life happens. 
Okay? That will produce uh, plankton. that will have some organic matter in it. But it will also produce plankton that have got calcium carbonate shells. So this is a coccolith here. You also might grow some coral reefs. So you're removing organic, well, you're basically you're forming organic carbon, but you're also forming inorganic carbon. You're also forming calcium carbonate in the surface ocean. That means that the efficiency of these things, which we talked about the other time, so this is basically the, the carbon pumps. So um, this is organic carbon. So we take, we form organic carbon in the surface ocean that removes CO2 and that exports it into the deep ocean. That would lower atmospheric CO2. But if the same plankton have got calcium carbonate shells, we remove that calcium carbonate in the surface ocean. So we're removing alkalinity, we're lowering the pH, which means we'll actually increase the atmospheric CO2. Okay? So if you, if you want to sequester carbon dioxide in the ocean for geoengineering reasons or you want to explain your paleoclimate records, then it's really important that you know something about the ratio of organic matter production to carbonate production, to calcium carbonate production. Because if you have the same amount of those two, it won't change atmospheric CO2 at all. Okay, so the type of plankton you get is really important. Okay, and again, this is because if we have, uh, if we precipitate calcium carbonate, it moves our pH to lower values, which means that although there's less total carbon in the ocean, there is more CO2 to exchange with the atmosphere. Okay, so this is just to summarise that effect on these, this, this biological carbon pump. So this is the pumping of carbon dioxide into the deep ocean so it's not in the atmosphere. It's really dependent on this thing that's sometimes referred to the pick to pop ratio. So that's the particulate inorganic carbon, so calcium carbonate, to the particulate organic carbon. So if you produce lots of this, you draw down CO2. If you produce lots of this, you don't. Okay, so just, uh, just quite briefly, so that's, that's uh, we talked about these, these two kind of carbon pumps, the organic carbon pump, the, the inorganic carbon pump, and how they kind of counteract each other in an annoying way. Um, but there's also, uh, we, I want to think about this effect of, of temperature. Okay, so we know that CO2 is much more soluble, you get much more CO2 into cold water than warm water. Okay, um, and that explains some of the, the, the surface patterns that we saw, but, uh, but also if we look back in time, in colder periods, so this is, uh, this is now, this is many thousands of years in the past, these are uh, glacial, interglacial cycles, so this is now, this is the last glacial maximum. So the blue is a proxy for temperature, <coughs> not that the scale on because I'm slack, um, but when it's colder, there was less CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is, this, is, this is kind of a slightly circular argument in that um, we know that uh, low CO2 in the atmosphere will be to a less, lower greenhouse gas effect, okay? Uh, more CO2 makes it warmer, but also it works the other way around as well. So if you make the planet colder, that leads to more CO2 being dissolved in the ocean, okay? So the colder it gets, the more CO2 we can put in the ocean. So this is kind of uh, one of the climate feedbacks that can amplify natural variation in the Earth's kind of like climate, okay, uh, by, by changing the temperature of the ocean, which can determine how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, and therefore the magnitude of the greenhouse gas effect. Okay, um, so again, this is another summary, which um, will be available on the um, you know, thing there. Uh, so important things are the temperature and the efficiency of these biological pumps, inorganic and organic, um, and also the ventilation of the deep ocean. So if you if you if you if you if the oceans circulate very slowly, okay, that gives the water more time to accumulate carbon from the surface ocean, okay, uh, more t more time to lose oxygen. Um, so if you, if you circulate the oceans more vigorously, you can store less extra carbon in the deep ocean and more of it will be in the atmosphere. So ocean circulation also has a strong control on the distribution of gases between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, 
Right, we're almost at an end here. So I just thought I'd show this up and just to give some, some evidence for this ocean acidification um, effect. Um, some of you might have done this in ELE in my practical, but you can see here the red curve is atmospheric CO2 going up. And then the blue curve is a measure of the dissolved CO2 in the water, okay, in, a, in station Aloha, which is just off the coast of Hawaii. You can see that closely follows the rise in CO2. And that's driven by this Henry's Law relationship. If the atmospheric CO2 goes up, the ocean CO2 should go up as well. And you can see here the impact of that in terms of the ocean pH, that as the CO2 is going up, we're acidifying the ocean. Okay, pH is going down. Um, and just finally, uh, uh, I thought a, an example from the geological record would be quite neat. So this is a kind of longer term change. So this is now uh, zero million years, and this is 65 million years ago here. So the dinosaurs died here. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this event here. So this is the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, sometimes called the Late Paleocene Thermal Maximum. But you can see this, is a, this green curve is a, is a proxy uh, using oxygen isotopes that's thought to relate to global temperature. Okay? So you can see there's a big spike in global temperature just here. And this is that record, uh, but flipped on its side. So we've got 55 million years ago to 54 and a bit million years ago. And instead of oxygen isotopes now, we're looking at carbon isotopes on the left. And this is a, a kind of a proxy for stuff happening in the carbon cycle. Are there either adding uh, carbon that's got a different isotopic fingerprint or, um, or changing the, the cycling of carbon in the ocean? But you can see that there's been, there was a big perturbation in the carbon cycle here. And it turns out that we, this was thought to be the addition of either an enormous amount of, of uh, methane or CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, so this is a big global warming event, and that explains that spike in temperature. Um, but if we look at what's happened to the sedimentary record here, so this is uh, that same sedimentary core here. You can see it's kind of light colored and then suddenly goes dark colored because all of the calcium carbonate has started to dissolve. Okay, and that's what we see on this right-hand side here. So at different depths in the ocean, we can see that the calcium carbonate is being dissolved away. And that's as a response to this increase in CO2 and this ocean acidification. Okay? So uh, the kind of the take-home message I want you to get from this slide is that if you dump loads and loads of CO2 into the atmosphere, and this is kind of analogous to what we're doing now, right? We're just totally screwing it up, right? What will happen is the ocean will acidify, which it's doing now, and that will cause the carbon carbonate in the ocean to dissolve. And that dissolved uh, carbon, calcium carbonate in the ocean, that will raise the alkalinity. It will s increase the buffering capacity of the ocean, which will eventually reduce the atmospheric CO2 concentration by changing the speciation between uh, CO2, bicarbonate, and carbonates. Now, the important thing I want you to remember is that so this process took from here to here. So that's 100,000 years. Okay? So that's the kind of time scale that we're looking at. Repair, the ocean will repair what we're doing to the, the planet, but it will take at least 100,000 years, which is kind of too long to wait, really. Um, anyway, a bit of a downer. But, uh, anyway, so uh, this summary, which I think you have. Do you have this summary? I was nice and gave you the summary. So this is stuff that kind of you should know. That should be... Subscripted, that was an error. Um, okay, so uh, that's, that's me done for today. Um, tomorrow, uh, it's not me. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, I have to go somewhere and do some stuff. Uh, so I think you have Simon tomorrow, and then I'll switch your room back in later on. Um, yeah, so if you've got questions about life, in general, or oceanography, um, post them on the discussion forum, and I'll attempt to address them. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll do a demonstration about some of the CO2 stuff in the practical on Tuesday for those that are coming to that. All right then.